All right, folks. Well, I'm excited. I'm excited for what God is doing, and I want you to know that the Lord isn't finished yet. I look forward to sharing more and more good news and celebrating God's plan and his provision and his faithfulness in the days ahead. How many of you look forward to seeing God do great things? Amen? All right, well, that's good because there are more great things in store. I promise. I promise. You know, sometimes we get kind of excited. We get kind of excited about something that we think is really, really good, and, and we just can't hold that excitement in. I, I, I don't know if, if you experience that very often, but I do. I get excited, and, and I like to share my excitement with whoever I can. Sometimes, sometimes I wait to do a big reveal when things are all ready, and I'm, I'm just hanging on and wait to see how are people going to respond, what are they going to think, you know? It's like Christmas all over again. Sometimes I, I get a little too excited, and I share something prematurely. Anybody? Anybody relate to that? Anybody? You know, I, when Ani Ansi and I, we had, Abigail was a baby, and we were so excited. God had blessed us with another child, and we shared. I was preaching. I've shared with some of you before. I was, I was uh, ministering up at the church that we came out of in Rockland and some other churches, and three churches, mega churches, huge congregations, great attendance. Big fo- I was telling everybody, we're pregnant, it's so exciting, it's so exciting, you know, and we got to get back into, you know, the, the we called it the, um, the banana. Uh, it was a big yellow truck with a purple stripe down the side, kind of the Bible man colors. Sometimes we call it the Bible mobile. Um, and, uh, and, and we're like, we got to drive back to where we lived at the time in Missouri, and we've got a doctor's appointment, our 12-week appointment is a big deal. And we went back, and we did not get the news we were expecting when we got there. And we had shared with all these people, and all these folks were like so excited for us. And now we have to tell thousands of people that things didn't turn out just the way we expected. Any, anybody relate to that? Yeah. Or, you, you know, anybody ever prepare a dish maybe that you haven't prepared before? But Martha Stewart said that if you followed this recipe, Betty Crocker, you know, she spelled it out in great detail. And, and you, sa- you thought, you know, if I just follow the instructions exactly as prescribed. Everything's going to be perfect. You lay that meal out for someone you love, and you're so excited to see that look of ecstasy on their face as they take their first bite, and what you see is something other. It just didn't turn out the way you wanted. Anybody ever experienced that? Maybe some of us have had that kind of experience this year where something in 2017 did not turn out just the way you wanted. I need, I need some help. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, ladies, is, is there a lady here who has, what do you call them little things with a pop-up mirror? What is, a compact? Is there a lady here who has a compact? Any lady who has a compact that you would lend to me for a moment? Anybody? Anybody help your pastor out? Come on. Is it, you have one? Seriously. Look at y'all. You're so humble. No vanity out there at all. You don't carry those little mirrors around. No, no. Okay. May I borrow that compact? Thank you very much. She wasn't a plant. She didn't know this was coming. Um, but this is, this is from Cover Girl, so you know it's good. All right. And, and if you open it up and there's a little, look at this. I'm not going to. No, not going to do it. Not going to do it. I'm not going there. I'm, dude, that is not how I roll. All right? Same. Now. What's inside here is a mirror. And how many of you know that mirrors reflect the truth? Anybody know that? Mirrors reflect the truth. That can be a really good thing. That can be a really, really painful thing. Amen? Let me tell you something else about mirrors. 
mirrors not only reflect the truth, but depending on the angle and the bevel and the type of mirror that it is and your position in relationship to that mirror, mirrors can distort the truth. How many of you know that to be true? Mirrors can distort the truth. That's my prayer today. Well, I want to talk to you today about adjusting the rear view. Because sometimes when we look in the mirror, while what we see is truthfully what's there, sometimes we get a distorted view of it. Sometimes the mirror can make things look better. They can make objects closer than they really are. They appear to be. Sometimes a mirror can make things look worse. No, it's not the dress that makes you look that way. It's the mirror. It's bad. Me get a different mirror. Mirrors can distort the truth. So I want to encourage you today as we turn the page on 2017 to take a biblical perspective of adjusting the rear view. Because you know that in a car... You've got that rear view mirror, and it's supposed to help you. But if you don't use it properly, it can actually cause great harm. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 43, where we find a passage of Scripture that addresses the rear view. Please stand to your feet as we read together from the Word of the Lord, beginning at Isaiah 43 and verse 16. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Verse 18, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, your word speaks to our hearts even today as we turn the page on a year that for some was a record-setting year, a great year, a time to be remembered and celebrated, and for others, a year marked with pain with suffering, with loss, with heartache, with failure. For all, we turn the page. Lord, help us to forget the former things and not dwell on the past. Help us, God, to see that you are doing a new thing and welcome the new things that you have in store. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it's interesting that in a passage it says to forget the past, not to dwell upon it. This passage begins with a reminder of the past, with a glance at the rearview mirror. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, that's in the rearview mirror. Hundreds of years later, the Lord says, hey, take a quick glance. I'm the one who parted the waters, who destroyed Pharaoh's armies, who delivered my people. You know that I am able to meet every need. That's the truth in the rearview mirror. Now, forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. I would submit to you that Isaiah 43, 18 
is as relevant for you and me today on this last day of 2017 as it was for those hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus Christ. There's no turning back. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. The Hebrew here implies actively choosing not to remember or even be reminiscent about past failure or victories. This passage began with a flashback to the parting of the Red Sea, and then God said, forget about those glory days. Forget about it. Or, if you're Italian, forget about it, huh? I want to encourage you. The Word of God is not ignoring the path that gets us here. The Lord our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when we glance at the rear view, we have reminders throughout the course of life's journey of how He provides, how He delivers, how He makes a way. But that's all behind us. Have you ever noticed how small a rear view mirror is in comparison to the windshield upon which it's attached? Friends, we got to be careful how much time we spend focusing in on that little thing. Now, I'm going to confess to you, in case you didn't know this, I have some issues. The more you get to know me, the more clear that becomes, the less funny it is. I've got issues. One of my issues that I'm, I'm working on, I've been working on it for quite a while now, is, uh, is I'm a dweller. Any dwellers out there? Anybody? You know, something happens, and you replay it in your mind, and you think, how could I have done that differently? If I'm approached with that situation in the future, this is the positive spin. If I'm approached with that situation in the future, how will I deal with it differently to seeing a different result? That's positive, right? But it's hard to let go. In fact, just a few minutes before service started today, I was all giddy and excited about something that had happened. Something that was coming, a change. And it wasn't ready yet. And I, in my excitement, I shared with somebody. In my enthusiasm, I said, hey, take a look at this. It's going to be available like next week and it's going to be awesome. And, it's, and you are one of the very few people who's going to benefit from it. Isn't that wonderful? Can I say, they were less than enthusiastic. They saw it as less than wonderful. They had questions for which I had no answers because I wasn't ready yet. And you know what happened? My, my really awesome, enormous balloon of enthusiasm started to go. <laughs> and about two minutes later, maybe three, maybe three minutes and 30 seconds. I was in my office with the leaders of this church to do what we do on Sunday mornings before service, and that is pray for the preaching of the word. And we come in there, and I looked at him, and I said, I need prayer. Because I just had an experience that deflated me. When I look in the rearview mirror, it wasn't a big thing. It wasn't. But it's so close that it appears larger than it really is. My mirror was distorting it. I didn't have to look back a day or two days. It was minutes. How many of you know that when God is doing something in your life, when he wants to get your attention, he often allows you to walk through things that prove his word? The Lord knew that I was about to preach on adjusting the rearview mirror. He just put something in my rearview mirror that was right there. Then I'm supposed to get up and act like I got it all together? Well, guys, I don't have it all together. I've got issues. Anybody know what I'm talking about? No, I don't mean me. I mean you. Do anybody? Anybody? You know what I'm talking about? It's some issues? Okay. Yeah. Here's the thing. 
God's word admonishes us. Whether the thing in our past that appears in our rearview mirror is wonderful and amazing and incredible or deflating. He admonishes us to take our eyes off that mirror and look at the windshield. To let go of the past. Let go of the past. That's what Jesus was speaking of when he told his followers about his return. When he would come back. The Bible tells us in in Bible prophecy that one day he will return, the second advent, the second coming of Jesus on a, a great white horse in the sky, and everyone in the entire world will see him. And all of heaven's army will follow him. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And then those of us who are still living who follow him will meet them in the air. That's the context in which Jesus was speaking in Luke chapter 17, beginning at verse 30, when he said, It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the housetop with possessions inside should go down and get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. I think it's interesting, as I was looking at this passage of Scripture, it occurred to me that Jesus is speaking to two different groups of people because some will be sleeping, Jesus said. Others will be working. People will be going about their lives, doing what they do. No one knows the day or the hour. And Jesus uses two examples in this particular passage. One is of people probably relaxing on their rooftop terrace like a balcony. They've got their barbecue grill. They've got their easy chairs. They're sipping on a nice iced drink. Everything's good as they soak in the sun. And Jesus returns and he says to them, don't worry about running downstairs and getting all dressed up. Don't grab your fine possessions and your belongings. Don't cling to the things of the past that this world has treasured and values. No, I'm coming for you. Be ready to meet me in the air. I love the imagery there of those on the rooftop. And he tells them not to go down. Because he intends to lift them up. But he says the same to those who are working in the field. Who are toiling those who are laboring in that moment, who maybe have been sweaty and dirty. And I, I don't know about you, but this last week, little John and Jen and I, we were working on, on, on ripping out some old carpet in a room in the back of the building. And underneath that old carpet, there's a thick layer of padding that's still stuck to the glue that was applied directly onto a beautiful, finished oak floor decades ago. Let me just say, we will all stand before God on the day of judgment. Mm, Somebody's going to be held accountable, people. Mm, mm. I'm sure at the time it seemed like a good idea, right? But that carpet got stained. It got ugly. And underneath it is oak that was laid in 1948, still looking pretty. We had to scratch and scrape and sand hours and hours of throwing dust in the air and getting grit and dirt under our nails and across our brows we'd wipe. Not done with it yet, but we're going to bring back to life that which has been hidden. How many of you know that not all change? Not all change is a rejection of the past, but rather building on the foundation that's already been there allows us to have a positive change to move forward in God's will in many cases. Yeah, this week as we were working on that floor, we were getting dirty. And you know, if the Lord had returned in that moment, I may not have been out in the field working the crops, but I I wouldn't be looking fine and dandy for Sunday morning go to meeting. 
the temptation might be there in those moments of sweat, soil, stench, to just run home, take a quick shower, freshen up a bit. How many of you know that, you know, when you're going to be around people, when you're going to be around important people, you want to kind of gussy up a little bit, don't you? I remember as a kid right here in Lodi at the corner of Toke and Central, my pastor more than once said, friends, folks who stay away from church because they feel like they're not righteous or not good enough, like they need to clean up their act before they can present themselves before God. They don't understand what church really is. This is where we come to receive God's cleansing power, to be energized. Feeling like you have to be righteous to enter the house of the Lord is like trying to get clean before you take a bath. It's the bath that makes you clean. Jesus would say to those working in the field on the day of his return, don't go back for anything. I will make you clean on your way up. I'll make you clean in the air. In fact, he'll give you a whole new body. Whatever is waiting for you in that house will only distract you and deter you and prevent you from receiving the gift of eternal life that God has for you on that day. I want to encourage you today. We have to let go of the past. And in the midst of this beautiful word picture, Jesus hints toward painful memory. See, people are glancing at the rear view. He's telling them to look forward. He doesn't doesn't have them stare at the rear view and pull it all apart into details. Jesus isn't the pastor of Radiant Life Church who pulls apart all the details. No, he's the king of kings and lord of lords. He's the fulfillment of all God's promises. He's the savior. He's the alpha and the omega. He doesn't have to explain it all in detail because he knew his audience and he knew that they were familiar with the story and he said three words. Remember Lot's wife. I love this. Then Jesus moved on. He said, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it and whoever loses their life will preserve it. With the words, remember Lot's wife, Jesus brought to their memory one who defied God, who rebelled and refused to let go of the past. Life with Jesus is all about transformation, which is just a fancy word for change. When we focus on the rearview mirror, we're more likely to have a collision with objects in front of us than we are to arrive at our destination safely. And how many of you know that when there is a multiple car collision on a roadway, the car in the back is always at fault? You saw it coming. You should have maintained a safe distance. You should have been more alert and more aware. You rear-ended the guy in front of you because you were too busy with the radio dial, too busy with the cell phone, or too busy staring in the rearview mirror. It doesn't matter. You're in the back. You could have prevented the accident. And so God's word to you and to me is don't look back. Don't stop. Don't get stuck in the past. Lot's wife is not mentioned by name in a single place in the Bible. But her defiant focus on the rearview mirror is clearly detailed and referenced by Jesus himself. We read in Genesis chapter 19, beginning at verse 16, about Lot and his family whom God had spared because Abraham, his uncle, loved him and begged that Lot be spared even though no one else in Sodom and Gomorrah honored the Lord God. There was none righteous. 
And so the Lord dispatched angels to warn Lot and his family and to rescue them. And that's where we pick up the story in Genesis 19, 16, when he hesitated. The men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and of his two daughters and led them safely out of the city. For the Lord was merciful to them. Verse 17, as soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains for you will be swept away. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. God's admonishment to Lot, whom he spared, was don't look back and don't stop. And the Bible tells us that Lot and his daughters followed that instruction, even though they hesitated. Why did they hesitate? Because they got caught up in the city they lived in. All their friends were doing it. People seemed to be prospering and enjoying the wicked, reprehensible, sinful lives they were leading. Though Lot knew the truth, leaving the grit and the grime of Sodom and Gomorrah was hard for him to do. How many of you know that we live in difficult days? Anybody? Has anybody here ever watched the television news? Anyone? Have you ever opened a newspaper, a magazine, or turned on your home page to see the news feed and discovered that there are some bad things happening in our world? Anybody? If we've read Bible prophecy, we may know that the signs of the end are obvious around us. If we watch Christian television or listen to Christian radio, we are aware of the fact that certain things that are happening today may well be the fulfillment of prophecy given by God thousands of years ago, signaling the imminent return of Jesus Christ. And yet, and yet, we have a hard time letting go of this muddy, mucky, filthy world in which we live. So don't point your finger at Lot and his family and say, why did you hesitate? Because the reality is, we all get a little comfortable. How many of you know that when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, what awaits after this life is better than the best this life has to offer? Anybody know that? And yet it's hard to let go, isn't it? It's hard to say goodbye, even if it's only for a little while. You know, at the bottom of every email that I send from my church email account, is a passage of scripture from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. It's a passage of scripture because I email people in the church, and I send emails and reply to emails to folks outside of this church. And that passage of scripture is there whether my email is a word of encouragement, sharing good news, or maybe dealing with an issue that has arisen. At the bottom of every email I send is 1 Timothy 1.15, in which the Apostle Paul wrote to young Timothy, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Yep. At the bottom of every email, I profess that Jesus came to save sinners, and I acknowledge that I'm the worst. That's not for anybody else, to be honest with you. It's for me. It's a reminder that every time I get really bent out of shape about the fact that they're not honoring the price that was posted on something, and I want to just mm, let the old man come out. That this is a child of God doesn't mean 
that I'm going to get beat up or that I'm going to back down. But hopefully, hopefully I can tame this tongue. It's a reminder. It's a reminder that every person who has failed and fallen short of God's glory is redeemable by the blood of Jesus Christ. Because if he could save me, he could save anybody. It's a reminder to me not to judge others as less, but to acknowledge the fact. Acknowledge the fact that God sees a value in them that may not be obvious in the rear view mirror. Yeah, we're told in Genesis chapter 19, verse 26, Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Friends, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you that when we get so fixated on the past that we can't see the future that God has for us, that we face a terrible destruction, an untimely end, an unpleasant condition. And we are prevented from experiencing the fullness of God's protection and his provision as he unfolds his plan in our lives. Here at Radiant Life Church, we're committed to sharing life's journey through growing relationship with Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you today to welcome God's next step. Isaiah 43, 19 continues by saying, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. God says, I am doing a new thing. How many times we miss all the opportunity that's in front of us because our eyes are so fixed on that tiny little distorting mirror. Friends, I want to encourage you today that welcoming God's next step requires us to accept the fact that the next step requires faith. The next step requires faith. We talked about Lot's wife just a little bit because really the most notable thing Lot's wife ever did besides bear him children in Scripture is look back and turn into a pillar of salt. I want to focus for a moment on somebody else in the Old Testament. Another hero of the faith. Hebrews 11.2 talks about a specific woman of faith. We're told, by faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Whoa! The prostitute Rahab lands in the faith hall of fame of the Bible. But more than that, she landed in the direct lineage of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because Rahab had faith. Rahab saw that God was definitely going to bring a change. And she was willing to be on God's side of change. Friends, I want to encourage you today. God is definitely going to bring a change. We must be willing to be on God's side of change. And that next step requires faith. In Joshua chapter 2, verse 8, we read this. Before the spies lay down for the night, she, Rahab, went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. Rahab acknowledged the truth of the situation. She glanced at the mirror. 
She could see what had happened. Spies had just entered the land. This was a part of God fulfilling his plan. And nothing stops God because that same rearview mirror showed the Red Sea parting. She only had to glance at it to know he flooded it down on top of Pharaoh's army. He destroyed the most powerful army in the world at that time. And now these spies are here, sent as agents of that same God. Rahab had no doubt at all that God was going to do something great. In fact, all of the people in the city of Jericho were terrified. They were afraid of these men. And rather than push them away, rather than hide them, rather than yell out, hey, come get them, here are the spies, kill these two before the rest show up. Rahab hid them. Because she knew that the Lord had given the land to them. God had already made a way to accomplish his will. Yes, Rahab had faith to take the next step. But the next step not only requires faith, the next step requires concern. Many times we fail to act out of apathy. But Rahab was so concerned for her family that she risked her comfort and her safety to ensure that they would be included in God's plan. She didn't resist God's will by fighting to hold on to the only life that she had known. She embraced God's will in such a way to provide salvation, not only for herself, but for those that she loved. We read in Joshua chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. Now then, please swear to me, by the Lord, that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Friends, I want to encourage you that Rahab did not harbor these spies simply by accident. It wasn't a whim. Rahab acted intentionally. And she wanted something in return. She knew that the God of these spies was the God who saves, not just the God who destroys. And what Rahab wanted was for her family to be saved. Her family. It's interesting to me that After thousands of years, we still refer to Rahab by her sin, the prostitute. Wouldn't it be naive to suppose that her family overlooked that sin? Either they were complicit and shared a similar lifestyle and thereby justified their own sin, or they were indignant. They may have looked down upon Rahab. Maybe ridiculed her. Maybe even excluded her from certain family gatherings and special celebrations. Because she wasn't worthy. You know what's interesting to me is I don't see anything in here about Rahab getting revenge on her family. I don't see anything here about Rahab trying to one-up her family trying to cut to the front of the line. Instead, Rahab has concern for her family. Not only asking for her safety and her life to be spared, but for the Lord to spare their lives. Is anybody here concerned for someone close to you? Anybody here willing to act on their behalf, to be intentional, to see salvation, occur in their lives and transformation through the name of Jesus Christ? If so, we have to accept that the next step not only requires faith, that the next step not only requires concern, but the next step requires adapting. And this is a tough one. Adapting. It's another way of saying change. 
See, putting our faith in action often requires us to do things that others cannot or will not do because many refuse to change. But we as followers of Jesus must adapt. In James chapter 2, beginning at verse 25, we read, In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. I want to challenge you for a moment that this passage of Scripture is not saying that it was by Rahab's actions that she was saved. It was by her faith she was saved. And that not of herself, that even she could not boast. It was a free gift from God. I want to encourage you today with the truth of the fact that Rahab had faith in God enough to act upon that faith by adapting to her circumstances when those around her, perhaps even her family, refused to do so. The Bible does not say that her entire family helped her to harbor these spies. It doesn't say that. They may have been complicit. They may have participated. But we don't have that detail. But her entire family was spared. Not because of her actions, but because of her faith which she put into action. See, our action is evidence of our faith. And in order to act on our faith, we absolutely must adapt in an ever-changing world. We must adapt. If we continue to act the same way we've acted before, we can expect the same results we received before, but how many of you know the world is changing around us? The world is changing around us. We must adapt without compromising the gospel. Rahab wasn't considered righteous because of her behavior. She was considered righteous for what she did as evidence of her faith. It wasn't her righteousness. The best she ever did, according to God's word, is filthy rags before God. And I'm not putting down Rahab because Jesus Christ died to save sinners, and I believe I can, with my whole heart, say, of whom I am the worst. I'm no Rahab, folks. I think I'm worse. Now, I don't measure sin. That's God's job. But I know the depth of my sin. I know the despair of my heart. And I know that Jesus Christ paid the price so I wouldn't have to live in that, but I could be set free. So when we look at somebody like Rahab, putting faith into actions, it's evidence of the fact that God has already transformed her life. She adapted to her circumstance. She realized that change was coming. She didn't hold on to the past. She jumped onto God's winning team and intentionally made sure that those she loved most had a chance at survival and to be able to thrive and to move forward. And her name was remembered as a woman of faith. And her place was secured in the direct lineage of Jesus Christ for all eternity. Wow. That is what happens when people of faith take the next step for God by adapting. Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 13, admonishes us, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have yet taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. My translation Folks, I haven't arrived. I haven't. Day by day, I glance at that mirror and I'm reminded of the truth. The truth of my past, that my greatest victories fall short 
of the glory of God. That my failures have earned me a one-way ticket to a place God never intended for you and me to go. But when I glance at that rearview mirror, I also see moments along the way when God showed up and he showed off his awesome power. When he brought transformation. And he continues to transform. To accomplish his will. And I'm not there yet. As the Apostle Paul said, I've not yet taken hold of it. My translation of this, but one thing I do, taking my eyes off the rear view mirror, I stare out the windshield, I focus fully on the road ahead, I engage in the course that the Lord has laid before me, and I commit to sharing life's journey through growing relationship with Jesus Christ and leading this church down the path that God has laid out for us. How do we adjust our rear view on a day like today? Well, adjusting the rear view means letting go of the past. Letting go of the past by choosing not to stop and look back, by stepping forward in faith. Adjusting the rear view means caring enough to act. Yes, adjusting the rear view means adapting our methods to ever-changing road conditions without compromising the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is still the power of God that brings salvation. Friends, I want to encourage you today. Change is coming. It's adjust that rear view. Focus our eyes forward and welcome the next step in God's will.